Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Eric, and I welcome you to the Wednesday session of the Biomedics Academy series. Uh, during the webinar today, we'll be discussing how to perform a full arterial study, uh, because you know, 99% of the time, what we're doing with the PadNet devices, we're performing that full PadNet study. This is really sort of the heart and soul of the Biomedics Academy series. So let's get started. Uh, for those of you who are attending via uh, Zoom, uh, please click the raise my hand button in the Zoom, we Zoom webinar control panel if you have any questions. For those of you who are attending via Facebook Live, uh, I encourage you, if you have any questions, to give us a call at 888-889-8997 or to send an email to support at biomedics.com. Uh, so uh, today we'll be covering a couple of topics. The first is the disease itself, PAD or peripheral artery disease. We'll also be discussing how the test works, how to perform the test, how to send and receive the test, and how to bill for the test. Jumping right in here, peripheral artery disease is a uh, is a condition that's characterized by clogged or narrowed arteries, which can cause poor circulation to the extremities, uh, by, which we, by which we mean generally the arms, the legs, the brain, and the kidneys. However, it occurs most often, and it's most prevalent, and it will be the focus of our webinar today, about the, um, it interferes with blood flow in the lower extremities, particularly the legs, the ankles, and the feet. Uh, because of these clogged or narrowed arteries, the, um, is the blood that is supposed to be reaching the extremities, the, the feet, the toes, the ankles, isn't getting there. Because of the, um, you know, the, the clogging of the arteries, the blood needs to work harder to uh, get the blood where it needs to go in the extremities, which can increase the patient's risk for heart attack and stroke as well. PAD is a very prevalent condition that affects between 8 and 12 million Americans. Um, overall, that's an instance rate of about 3 or 4%. But if you look at specific groups, you, see, you start to see a lot more patients. Uh, for example, in patients over 50 with a history of smoking, about a third of patients have PAD. Uh, similarly, uh, patients who are over 50 with a history of diabetes also have about a one in three chance of having PAD. And all patients over the age of 70, again, have about a one in three chance of getting PAD. So those, uh, those groups, you know, sort of describe common um, medical users, common, uh, common patients that, that are in, the, are in offices a lot for a variety of reasons. So uh, again, most offices see a lot of these, of these patients. Because this is a um, systemic problem, this is you know, the, the uh, arterial, the plaque that builds up on the arterial walls occurs over the whole body, not just in the legs. Uh, there's a lot of overlap between patients suffering from PAD and uh, patients experiencing other forms of cardiovascular disease. Uh, for example, about 75% of patients with PAD also have heart disease. Uh, this is a uh, this is a graph comparing the uh, mort five year mortality rate of PAD to several major cancers. You'll see that PAD has a five year mortality rate of 32 percent, which is dramatically higher than certain common cancers like prostate cancer, breast cancer, or Hodgkin's disease, and similar to uh, colon and rectal cancer. So, in addition to this being a very common disease, particularly in um, uh, po uh, populations of patients that are in hospital settings or healthcare settings. It's also a very deadly, a very dangerous illness as well. Uh, the classic or most common symptom for PAD is called claudication or inter intermittent claudication, which is to say pain while walking. Um, patients with uh, PAD, as they use their muscles, the muscles require more oxygen. Because of the limited blood flow to the extremities, that doesn't happen, which can cause a cramping or burning sensation in the patient's legs as they exercise. As the disease worsens, this can lead to resting leg pain, which means that that cramping or burning sensation begins to occur all the time. Uh, the body uh, also has a difficult time healing itself because of the lack of oxygenated blood to the extremities, which means that... Um, many patients with PAD begin to develop uh, non-healing ulcers around their, their feet or their ankles. Uh, again, they're not healing themselves properly, so uh, this can cause uh, even simple injuries or the ulcers themselves to develop into gangrene. Um, as the condition worsens, uh, the 
uh, there may not there may simply be not enough blood there may simply not be enough blood to sustain the leg itself which is, uh, is a situation called critical limb ischemia which often results needs to result in amputation so really what we're doing when um, when we're performing PA, uh, the PADNET study is we're trying to identify this disease as early as possible in, in patients uh, to really save as many limbs and lives as possible. Uh, other uh, other symptoms of PAD can include cold, le uh, cold legs and feet, poor hair and nail growth. My trainer had a saying that he, that he, he loved, uh, hair don't grow where blood don't flow. So you'll often find that patients, again, for because of the lack of blood flow, um, have unusual hair growth patterns or simply don't have any hair at all around their, uh, their, their legs and their feet. Uh, obviously, restricted blood flow problems to the lower extremities might cause uh, erectile dysfunction. Patients may have difficulty on that front. Uh, and then, again, the increased risk for heart attack and stroke that we discussed uh, a couple of slides ago. Uh, risk factors in PAD for PAD include patients over the age of 50. This is a, an age-dependent illness, and as, the, as uh, the patient grows older, they are more likely to develop or have PAD. Uh, but risk factors include patients over the age of 50 with a history of diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, high cholesterol, and smoking. Other risk factors for PAD include uh, patients who have uh, foot or toe pain, uh, patients who have discolored or pale toes and feet. Uh, patients with PAD, uh, because of the lack of blood flow, often, often lack a, a sort of rosy flush over the feet, as you can imagine. And so you'll often find that patients with PAD have feet that are um, clammy or pale. Uh, patients who have skin wounds or ulcers on the feet that are slow to heal. We've discussed the non-healing ulcers already. Uh, also, uh, additionally, you may try to check for a toe, uh, a toe pulse or, excuse me, a foot pulse, a pedal pulse in the patient and be unable to, uh, unable to find one. Uh, patients who have suffered a severe injury to the legs and feet. Um, I do want to take a moment here to highlight the fact, generally speaking, in, um, in this webinar, we're talking about PAD as it pertains to uh, a, the systemic buildup of um, the systemic buildup on the arteries that, can, uh, that causes the arteries to lose their elasticity, which, may, which can cause um, you know, a, a, a lack of blood flow. I want to highlight the fact that you may find patients who have PAD, but um, but the cause of their illness is, is somewhat different. Uh, it, PAD can be caused by blockages in the artery. Sometimes those are, are, uh, occur as a result of trauma or uh, of some kind. Uh, and so you may have patients that lack the risk factors, but because of that damage to the artery, have PAD. So I did, because we don't touch on that a lot during this webinar, I did want to take a second to highlight that you may see patients with PAD that, that's caused by a blockage rather than that sort of constricting of the arteries that we've mostly been talking about. Uh, and then lastly on this list, patients who have infections of the legs or feet that may be gangrenous. The uh, full PADNET study takes between 20 and 25 minutes to complete with an experienced technician, uh, and it takes pressures at the arms and the ankles uh, and often the toes to calculate the ABI, the ankle brachial index, and the TBI, the toe brachial index. Uh, it also, the uh, test also takes, uses cuff-based measurement to uh, record pulse volume recordings or PVRs uh, at three levels on the patient's legs as well. The ankle brachial index is calculated by simply dividing the pressure at the patient's ankle divided by the higher of the two brachial pressures. So for a variety of physiological reasons, the ankle pressure in the patient should be dramatically higher than the pressure in the arms. So if we measure the pressures in the arms and the ankles and the ankle pressures are lower, that's an indication that there's blood flow that should be, that should be reaching the ankles that isn't, which is a signal for PAD. Uh, the other measurement that's taken with the PadNet device are these pulse volume recordings uh, on the patient's legs. Typically, pulse volume recordings are taken at the above the knee, the calf, and the ankle locations, and often they're taken at the, the, uh, on, on the toes as well. Uh, these are the, these waveforms are really where the PadNet device shines. Um, the, the the lack of you know you 
uh, patients with abnormal waveforms often have normal or close to normal ABIs. So we've discovered that the waveforms are actually much more accurate at detecting PAD than the, um, uh, than, than the ABIs or the pressures. So this waveform is a, a, a fairly healthy waveform, a demo waveform, uh, and it, it really does a good job of showing, I think, um, what's, what we're actually looking at in the artery, which is actually the expansion and the contraction of the artery as, a, as blood flow passes through. So uh, if the, you can imagine that on our start point on the left, the artery is fully contracted. Uh, there is a heartbeat, there's a, an influx of blood, a rush of blood, and that wave, that artery expands very, very rapidly, which you can see on the, the graph itself because of the, the, the high slope, the steep slope on the left-hand side. Uh, the arteries are, healthy arteries, like this patient is here, are very, very elastic, almost balloon-like in their ability to uh, expand and contract. So that expansion from the increase in blood flow uh, happens very, very rapidly. But because of the elasticity, it doesn't stay at that peak very long. You'll notice that this peak here is very, very narrow uh, in comparison to some of the ones, some of the waveforms we'll be looking at later. So that waveform... Uh, that, uh, that artery is fully expanded, and then it begins to swiftly contract. Again, it is very elastic. And you'll see that, it, uh, that on the right-hand side, the slope is also very, very steep. The uh, artery is contracting very, very quickly. It, in fact, in a healthy patient, contracts so quickly that it actually rebounds upon itself, creating that little bump out or that dichrotic notch on the right-hand side. Now, I highlight the dichronic notch in particular because it's really the first thing to go in a patient that begins to develop PAD. So, uh, again, this is a, I just want to highlight, this is a healthy waveform. Here are some examples of waveforms on, in the condition where the patient is uh, worsening, you know, beginning to develop at different levels of PAD. You'll notice here on the top, uh, mild PAD, those waveforms are still very, very tall. The, t the peaks are very, very narrow. Um, so the uh, other, so, and they otherwise look fairly normal. They have a, they're a little mountainous in comparison with those sort of sinuous curves we were looking at on the last slide. But otherwise, they're about the same size and they're they're pretty close to the same shape, just missing that dichrotic notch on the downward facing slope on the right hand side. As the disease worsens, however, uh, the uh, way the starkest thing that happens, the most apparent thing that happens, is the waveforms begin to lose amplitude. Um, these waveforms are not nearly as tall uh, in, in patients that are starting to have moderate PAD as they are uh, with patients without PAD. And the, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll start to notice that the peaks and the troughs on those waveforms uh, start to sort of round out or bowl out a little bit. So where before we were looking at very narrow peaks and very narrow troughs, these sort of, these start to become a little bit wider and a little bit more, uh, a little bit rounder or a little bit hillier compared to the mountainous things that we were looking at previously. As the, as the disease worsens, uh, the, uh, those waveforms lose amplitude and they become even rounder. So those peaks and those troughs start to become, uh, you know, it starts to become puddles or ripples in a puddle rather than uh, these big peaks that we were looking at earlier. Uh, in patients with severe or critical PAD, it may, be, it may be not be possible to see much of an expansion or a contraction at all. Uh, they, they, these um, waveforms start to become so small that they're almost minimal. Patients should present for the test in loose, comfortable clothing with their limbs exposed. A lot of offices have just have the patients come in with a change of clothes or you know, make, wear shorts and a t-shirt. That works fine. Um, if some offices prefer, you know, have a, a set of gowns that they use for other exams, again, that works fine as well. We just need to make sure that the patient's arms and legs are free. Patients should not have consumed caffeine or have uh, tobacco products before the, for at least 30 minutes prior to the test. Those um, products do interfere with the patient's blood flow and can make things a little non-diagnostic in some situations. Uh, the patient should rest without moving or speaking before the test starts uh, for about five minutes. A lot of offices use that sort of five, um, five minute rest period to do the data entry 
uh, for the patient, entering the patient's demographic information, which we'll do in just a second here for a, de uh, a demo study. Uh, but it's, if you are an office that prefers to enter the patient's information ahead of time, I know a lot of offices uh, enter that for these kinds of tests at the beginning of the day when there are little, things are a little bit quieter. Uh, and in that, that's totally fine. That's, that's perfectly fine. But you do need to make sure that the patient, uh, before the test begins, does have a few minutes to rest quietly without moving or speaking. Uh, there are eight or 10 cuffs which are typically used for the study. Uh, the first two go around the arms above the ankles and we're going to use those to take pressures. Uh, two go above the, uh, two go, uh, above the knee, two go around the calf. These, wave, uh, these cuffs are used just for waveforms. Two cuffs are placed around the ankles which are used for both pressures and waveforms. Uh, and then there are optional uh, you can optionally place the toe cuffs around the patient's great toe uh, and get pressures and waveforms there as well. Uh, and then the last, the last function here that I wanted to mention is called the PPG probe or the photoplethysmography probe. This is a light sensor or a, it, rather an infrared light sensor that uses infrared light to detect blood flow beneath the, patient's, the surface of the patient's skin. We use this um, probe when we're performing the pressures, so uh, at the above the knee, excuse me, at the arm and the ankle locations. Um, and we basically uh, place the probe on the patient's hand or foot when we're performing those pressures is basically op going to operate like a, a stethoscope in this in the situation where you are um, you know if you were sitting the patient down and taking their blood pressure manually with a blood pressure cuff and a stethoscope uh, it's very similar to what the padnet device does when you are um, when it's taking pressures but the uh, PPG probe is basically act, acting as our stethoscope, and we'll go over that in, in a moment here as well. When you're placing the PPG probe on the patient uh, on the patient's hand, I always recommend either the the uh, either of the patient's first two fingers, the pointer or the middle finger here, on either of the the uh, the first two segments of those fingers, so uh, uh, the inside, so to speak, or the underside of the patient's first two knuckles. Uh, you can see here uh, I have the patient on the second finger, uh, on the middle finger, on the inside of the first knuckle here. Uh, there are a lot of good places to get um, PPG probe results from the patient's hand. Uh, I prefer I prefer this location because I find that on the tips of the fingers or the pads of the fingers, which is a, a, a popular choice, I found a lot of artifact from motion, particularly among older patients. So the, uh, uh, the fingers sort of wobble a lot or, you know, shake a little bit just because they're unsupported and sort of out there away from the body. Uh, and you solve a little bit of that artifact by moving the probe a little bit farther up the patient's hand. Uh, similarly, on the patient's thumbs, I find a lot that because the thumbs are sort of angled up and away from the body rather than lying flat against the table like the, uh, like the fingers do, that there is a, uh, that light has a greater chance of reaching that light facing probe, which will create some artifact as well. So uh, these, these are my preferences, but like I said, there are a lot of good places to get uh, a pulse from the PPG probe on the patient's hand if you're looking for it. On the patient's foot, you are most of the time going to want to place your probe uh, around the patient's great toe, uh, like I have in this first picture here. If you're placing both the toe cuff and the uh, PPG probe, it can be a little tricky to fit both the white Velcro from the PPG probe, or rather the white Velcro from the toe cuff, and the black Velcro from the PPG probe. There's often just not enough real estate on um, many patients' toes to fit both of those. Um, my solution, and this is commonly, you know, how I apply the cuff to the patient, how I apply the probe to the patient's toes, is you can simply remove the black Velcro from the PPG probe and slide that up in between the patient's toe and the white toe cuff. Um, that that little non-compressible probe. I mean, typically we don't advise to have we don't advise anything for there to be anything between the the cuff and the patient's skin. But in this case, the um, that little non-compressible probe isn't going to affect the measurements on the pressures or the uh, waveforms in the uh, PadNet device. Uh, if the patient's great toe isn't working, uh, it may not be well vascularized. It may be uh, highly calloused, uh, highly calloused enough that the um, 
PPG probe can't detect blood flow beneath the surface of the skin. Uh, you can, in many cases, use the smaller toes from the, um, uh, on, on that same foot. Uh, the difficulty for, with those smaller toes is often that, again, the patient's toe simply isn't large enough to support the probe. Uh, in a lot of cases, but if you do have a patient, uh, then you can fit the PPG probe nicely on one of the smaller toes, uh, and the greater toe isn't an option for whatever reason, the smaller toes do work. So if you're not able to use any of the toes, again, for whatever reason, there are two locations on the patient's foot uh, that you can use to find a pulse so you can calculate those ankle pressures. Uh, the first one is along the top of the foot, and it can usually be found simply by um, uh, uh, lightly touching the top of the patient's foot down the, the arch of the foot along the top from the ankle. Uh, and that's called the dor dorsalis pedis. Personally, I find that one a little bit tricky to find in a lot of patients. Uh, so my go-to spot, if I need to um, place the uh, place the PPG probe, if I need a pulse from the PPG probe and the, and the toes aren't working, my typical uh, go-to is called the medial malalis. It's found on the inside of the patient's body or rather uh, the medial side of the patient's body. You're going to place your first three fingers together, your pointer, your middle, and your ring finger. You're going to place the ring finger against the back of the patient's ankle bone. And then where your pointer finger falls is about where you're going to want to place that PPG probe. There are two arteries running up and down the leg in that location, uh, and there's also one vein sort of sandwiched between them. So you may need to adjust the PPG probe a little bit until you're detecting the pulse from one of those two arteries very strongly. Obviously, the black Velcro from the PPG probe isn't going to wrap, wrap all the way around the patient's foot or the patient's ankle. Uh, and so if you do need to apply it to one of these locations, you can tape it in place like I've done. Uh, you can use double-sided tape. Uh, just apply one side of the uh, tape to the shiny face on the PPG probe and place the other side of the tape against the patient's skin. That works fine. Or uh, you can use Coban wrap, simply wrap that probe around, wrap around that probe to keep it flush with the patient's skin. I find it a little bit more intuitive uh, to show you guys setting up the test in the PadNet software itself. So give me just a moment while I move us over there. Okay, so for performing a new PAD test, what you're going to click when you're at this screen is perform new PAD test. Uh, give me just a second here. I'm actually going to put us in demo mode. I, uh, I sometimes forget to do that before I actually start the test. It's better to do it now. Okay. Um, the We're going to be testing. I've been testing some of our uh, founding fathers. I'm going to t test the... Uh, Mr. Richard Henry Lee today. Uh, so you enter the patient's first and the last name. You can click auto and that'll generate the number for you. Now, typically uh, you would want to enter each one, you would want to enter information on each one of these exclamation points so that you have um, all of the demographic information you, you need for the patient. But in this case, because of course I don't actually have Mr. Lee here, I am going to uh, list this as a screening and I'm going to skip the rest of these uh, the rest of these exclamation point boxes. Typically, uh, on an actual test on an actual patient, you would need to fill things here, uh, fill out things here as well. But because this is just a demo study and I've listed it as a screening, uh, we can skip that step here. Uh, the history uh, tab allows you to enter a lot of the risk factors for the patient, record those for the report. Uh, you'll be familiar with a lot of these risk factors based on you know the ones that we've gone over for the webinar. Um, so you'll see hypertension, tobacco use, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, etc. Uh, if you're wondering, uh, you, if you want to list the patient as um, being associated with one of these diseases as having them, you click uh, on one of the drop-down menus and you're presented with uh, unknown or mild, moderate, or severe. Now you might be, you, it, it's a little bit of a you might be wondering how we categorize those illnesses, what, ca uh, what does having moderate diabetes entail, for example. To find that out or to see that, you can just click diabetes and it'll bring up a pop-up with a list of how, those, how that risk factor is characterized. So I think I'm going to give uh, Mr. Lee here 
um, adult onset diabetes that requires insulin, which is moderate. Um, we'll also say that he's using tobacco use. Uh, and so we'll say that he's a current smoker. Again, very common for PAD patients. Uh, we're gonna enter in the patient's height and weight here. And then you'll see, um, I, I did mention that there was a lot of overlap between uh, PAD and other forms of vascular disease like cardiac or carotid artery disease. Uh, if the patient suffers from that, you can enter uh, the information here as well. Same thing as with the risk factors. Um, you just click on the, the risk factor, in this case, cardiac disease, and you can enter um, the, the severity based on the description. Uh, the, another section on the history tab is you can go into vascular procedures. If the patient has had something like a stunt or a, a stent or a shunt or a bypass graft, anything of that nature that may interfere with the way that their blood flows, uh, you can click the green add sign. It will bring up a list of different procedures. You can click on one, uh, let's see, dialysis access, for example. You can click OK, and then it will bring up a pop-up where you can enter all of the information about uh, you know, whatever bypass uh, the patient has had. Uh, the last part of the history section uh, is the note field. There are two note fields you can see top and bottom. I do want to highlight this because the bottom field is visible to the patient in a situation where they are providing the, um, if, where they request a copy of the report. So if you have anything, um, you know, I'd obviously recommend adding any notes for the interpreting physician that you feel are appropriate. Um, but I always use this, was, this one as an example here. Um, now, I always use the example patient is obese. Um, the patient is obese based on the height and weight that we entered. Uh, and it's, it's medically, it's clinically valuable. It's important that the interpreting physician know that. But at the same time, there are a, um, uh, you know, it's a, very, it's, it's a somewhat sensitive topic. So you may, um, you know, I would advise putting something along those lines in the top field here rather than the bottom. Uh, the second section, this next section here is called the indications tab. Uh, you do need an indication to perform a billable study. Uh, so this is a very, uh, a very critical, a very critical page here. You want to enter, make sure that the referring physician is entered. You can see that it reminds you about that because with that exclamation point. Uh, the first time that you enter a doctor, uh, you'll need to enter the patient's, the doctor's name, but after that, the doctor will just show in the drop-down menu, so you can just click there and select the doctor like I've done. Uh, these are the six uh, most common indications for, uh, PA, for the PAD study. Uh, we've discussed them during the webinar, so I'm sure you'll be familiar. Uh, claudication, rest pain, ulcerations, gangrene, trauma, or uh, lower extremity embolism or thrombosis. So uh, typically, the patient is going to have one of these um, uh, one of these diseases, for example, you know, like I said, claudication is uh, a very, very common PADNET, uh, PAD symptom, uh, a very common indication for the PADNET study. Uh, if the pay, there are there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of indications, so obviously this list of the six most common isn't inclusive. Uh, the uh, so if you have a an indication for the PADNET study. Um, I, I would recommend entering that in the additional information here. Uh, the ex example that I always use is I-73.0, which is um, the ICD-10 code for something called Raynaud syndrome. Uh, Raynaud syndrome is a micro microcirculatory problem that affects uh, blood flow to the extremities, typically the patient's hands and feet. Uh, and so you can see why there's some overlap between PAD and Raynaud syndrome. Uh, so um, if you're ever in a situation like this one where the indication isn't one of the six that we mentioned, I would just make sure to enter that in the additional information here. Uh, we're going to move to the PAD test. We're going to click perform. Uh, we're going to click on the patient's uh, right arm because that's where the test typically starts. I do want to highlight here uh, that the, because this is a demo study and we don't actually have Mr. Lee lying down on a table, um, the uh, the demo study does skip a step here. Uh, so typically when I, uh, when I get here, the system would ask me for 
uh, the system would ask me, do you detect a pulse? And it'll show a pop-up from the PPG probe. I'll show you what it looks like when we get back to the webinar. Uh, and you should be able to see a nice regular pulse, uh, a, a repeating pattern with a peak and a trough that repeats uh, over and over again. So uh, that'll be the first thing that, 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 in, uh, that on an actual study would pop up here. Um, but in this case, we're just going to click start. Uh, now, with the patient, the patient's um, cuff is inflating and it's starting to deflate at this time. You can see the pressure moving up and down on the left-hand side of the screen here. Now, and then we're presented with this refer return to flow trace. Uh, now, the, what we're actually doing uh, is, like I I'm described previously, it's very, very similar to performing a um, blood pressure on a patient where you have a, a cuff around their arm uh, and then a stethoscope over their elbow, except rather than using the stethoscope, we're using this PPG probe. Now, when you think about it that way, this trace starts to make a little bit more sense. On the left-hand side of the trace, um, at the beginning of the pressurization, the pressure is very, very high, and the limb is occluded. This prevents blood flow from making it to the hands, so the PPG probe that's on the patient's finger isn't reporting a pulse. So that's why everything on the left-hand side looks pretty flat. On the right-hand side, um, the cuff is very loose. It's not occluding any blood flow, and we have, a great, and we have some great big pulses there on the right-hand side. Uh, our focus, just like uh, when you're performing that, that manual blood pressure, is going to be on the, the middle of the test. And, we're start, and what we're really looking for, um, where we're going to select, is the place where you see the first pulse um, that eventually uh, after the occlusion. So um, uh, what we're looking for, just like on the uh, is there a pulse pop-up that we talked about a minute ago, is we're looking for a peak, we're looking for a trough, and we're looking for that pattern to repeat and continue as the trace moves from left to right. Uh, so the over here um, on the left-hand side, there's not much. On the right-hand, there's a lot. And we're really just looking for the very first little foothill here uh, between our flatlands on the left and our mountains on the right. Okay, so at this point, uh, this gives us a pressure of 133, very typical. Um, the, at this point, we would take the pressure on the left arm, which looks completely identical, um, and then we'd take waveforms uh, here. So we're going to move down to one of the, uh, to one of the legs. We're going to click start. Uh, the, the, the cuff will inflate briefly. I know that it says zero on this demo study, but it typically inflates to about 65 or 70. And then it gives you this, um, these, this repeating ser series of waveforms. Now you do have the ability to move the trace left or right. So typically, uh, so you're going to want to do that to try to fit as many waveforms on the trace as you can. Uh, in, in an ideal, in an ideal world, you'd be able to pick up uh, three waveforms on every screen. I'll tell you that that's not always possible depending on the patient. I've seen uh, a lot of patients where you can only comfortably fit two waveforms. I've even seen patients where you can really only fit one waveform and a half or so. And if that's the case, you know, that's the way the cookie crumbles. But we try to give the interpreting physician as much information as possible. Uh, and the best way to do that is to make sure they have as many waveforms as possible. Um, I also want to highlight that on the right hand side you have the ability to, to move the gain up and down. Uh, that one of the current features, one of the new features of the device is that the, uh, that's different over the previous version is that the system automatically measures the amplitude of the waveforms. In previous versions of the device uh, that was something that the technologists needed to do themselves. Uh, However, there, um, in order to do that, the system requires that the waveforms fit on the screen. You'll sometimes see patients uh, where the waveforms, and this occurs a little more, uh, a little more often in patients that are a little bit healthier than, than maybe a typical PadNet patient. Um, the waveforms are so large that they go up, they go up above the screen or below the bottom. 
do you detect a pulse screen that I mentioned a moment ago. So it's just, it's pretty, it's pretty basic. All you're looking for um, is a, is a repeating pattern, a, a peak, a trough, and then that pattern to continue. If you see a, a series of jagged lines or something that doesn't make sense, uh, you may need to uh, adjust the probe a little bit until you can find that pulse or uh, you may need to uh, adjust it so that light isn't getting at that light facing sensor because that will cause some some very unusual looking artifacts for you. Okay, uh, so I, I did, we, we got to the end of the study itself. Again, the actual, uh, the actual billable study itself is the pressures at the arms and the ankles, and then the waveforms at above the knee, the calf and the ankle location. Many offices uh, prefer, many offices like taking toe pressures and toe waveforms as well. In most situations, those toe waveforms and, and toe pressures are not a billable portion of the study. So by the same token, many offices choose to omit them just because it's, it's an extra step and it's not information they need. Now, I personally think that there's a lot of valuable information um, in the toe pressures and the toe waveforms. Uh, but in addition to that, they are billable in one, in one situation. Uh, for some patients, particularly diabetic patients, um, you may not be able to get a pressure at the ankles. The reason for the the common reason for this is that uh, the patient, uh, uh, excuse me, diabetic patients often experience vessel calcification, which can make the vessels non-compressible. The device literally won't be able to squeeze the ankles tightly enough to get a pressure through that vessel calcification. So uh, the toe, uh, the arteries of the toes are a lot less susceptible to that kind of calcification than the ankles are. And so uh, most of the time in a situation where you're not able to get those ankle pressures because of the calcified vessels, you can get the toe pressures instead, which allow you to get the toe brachial index or the TBI rather than the most, the more common ABI. In that situation, the, um, in that situation, the toe pressures are a billable portion of the study. Uh, however, there, uh, in, in other situations, though, they're helpful, but not billable. Uh, for example, the um, doctor uh, may be performing surgery on the patient's feet, and they want to make sure that there's enough blood flow in and out of the foot uh, for that wound to heal. They, um, the patient may have uh, toe ulcers, and you want to examine uh, blood flow in and out of the foot for that reason. Uh, or simply podiatrists or diabetic patients often have a vest vested interest in knowing how the blood flow is, is in and out of the patient's foot. And in that case, the doctor may request that for that reason. Um, but again, those are not uh, billable portions of the study. Uh, my, my next piece of advice about toe pressures is that they are nearly impossible to take in a situation where the patient is cold. Uh, the patient has cold toes, particularly, again, among diabetic patients. I, re I always recommend keeping the patient's feet as warm as possible um, for the test because there's really leaving the, uh, you know, taking the patient's shoes off and leaving the toes uh, hanging out in the air for 20 or 30 minutes typically means that it's very, very difficult to get a pressure. So I recommend leaving the patient's socks on as long as possible. And I know a lot of offices use a towel or a light blanket that they leave by the side of the testing environment uh, so that they can sort of drape that over the patient's feet and uh, keep those out of the chilly air here. Uh, my, and then uh, one, one last thing, the, uh, the best way to get data on the patient's toes the be is to have the toe cuffs oriented so that the clear hosing uh, is sticking out towards the, the center of the toe so that those two hoses are pointing toward one another. Uh, that, that places the sensor um, on the medial side of the toe, which is where the artery is closest to the surface and where you get the best data. Uh, after the test is completed, you'll click the test signed box and then you'll be able to navigate back to uh, the home page of the website, the home page of the PadNet software. You can click uh, send slash receive tests on the top right corner. That'll bring up a pop-up that will tell you there's a signed test and that's ready to send, click send sign tests, and those tests will be uploaded to the cloud network uh, for the interpreting physician. Uh, once the interpreting physician has read that study, click get, it, uh, get scored tests, and then you'll be able to download that test back to the laptop. Uh, the study that I've described today is 93923, uh, and that's far and away the most common CPG code uh, build for with the PadNet device. 
Um, that's the pressures at the arms and the ankles and then the waveforms at the above the knee, the calf and the ankle location. Uh, there are two other studies that can be performed, but um, that, that they're only done in very rare, you know, they're, they're definitely not very common studies at this point. Uh, the first one is 93922. Um, 93923 is called the full arterial study um, or the complete arterial study. 93922 is the uh, uh, limited arterial study, and that one takes pressures at the arms and the ankles and the waveforms at the ankles, uh, omitting the waveforms at the above the knee and the calf locations. Uh, the other than the fact that you're saving four or five minutes by skipping those those four waveforms, there's not a lot to recommend the study. The indications for the two tests are the same. So if you're indicated to do 93922, you're also you're already indicated to do 93923 anyway. Uh, and in there, you're missing a lot of valuable diagnostic information by missing the uh, waveforms at that area. And on top of that, the reimbursement just isn't as good. Uh, Typically, 2-2 reimburses between $75 and $90, and 2-3 reimburses for about $120 or $125. So you're, you're missing out on $35 to $50 of reimbursement to save yourself, again, maybe four minutes, probably less. Uh, the last study that can be performed is 93924. It's only performed in a situation where uh, the patient is a claudicant. You know, the patient has a, their, their indication for the study is Uh, is intermittent claudication, uh, and then you performed a tip a, a, a 93923 study already, and the result came up normal. In that situation, uh, you can have the patient come in, you can have them walk on a treadmill for about five minutes at a very low speed uh, until five minutes are up or their claudication sets in, at which point you lay them down on the table and perform the study again. Um, the study is not performed uh, very often because of the fact that you're, you're uh, it's only used if you're retesting a patient if that patient is a claudicant. And the Medicare rules specify that it needs to be done on a medical grade treadmill. I sometimes get questions about whether we can pace out the hall, whether you can pace out, pace out the hallway or have the patient walk up and down that way. And unfortunately, the requirements from Medicare do specify that it requires a treadmill. So for those reasons, it's not, it's, uh, it can be performed and it is occasionally, but uh, it's a very, it's a very rare test with the PadNet device. Uh, this is the super bill. Um, we, I uh, often hand this out to billing offices be, just to make their lives a little bit easier. And you can see here the CPT codes that are most commonly used, the recommendation to use the modifier, um, basic information about the patient. Uh, and then down below, um, these are sort of um, a more expanded list of our the most common ICD-10 codes. So you'll see uh, claudication, rest, pain, diabetes, ulcers, uh, uh, diabetes and ulceration. This isn't the, the whole page, uh, just a, a couple of sections from it, um, which you can use to, to bill for the study. At this point, we are nearing the end of the webinar, so I'm going to take a few minutes to highlight a couple of special offers through Biomedics this time. The first offer is uh, for technologist certification. Most insurances in most states have a requirement in place that uh, technologists performing these studies have a requirement have a certification through a nationally recognized body. At Biomedics, we're happy to get you in touch with a certification program through the American College of Foot and Ankle Orthopedics Medicine, that's ACFOAM. A training for the certification can be purchased if you would like, but more commonly involves the attendance of the webinars, like the one that you're at today, or by uh, viewing the recorded webinars on our YouTube channel. After you've been trained, the technologist will need to take and pass an online exam. They have uh, 30 days during that sort of probationary period uh, after the completion of the exam to perform 10 studies on 10 real patients. We'll review those studies for quality to make sure good quality studies are being performed. And we will uh, uh, issue the 12 month certification at that time. Uh, the renewal for the certification is free. Uh, and easy as long as you're performing at least one PadNet study a month in the intermeeting, you know, in the intervening year for the certification. Uh, if you miss a month, maybe you're out sick, uh, you just need to perform five tests in the following month to get back in compliance. Another free service I wanted to highlight is our chart review service. At your invitation, we can remote into your EMR to create a report 
uh, a pair of reports actually based on patient indications in the history. We'll filter those against previously performed PAD tests and provide you a script so you can easily contact those patients. If we find at least 100 patients, we'll provide a free month of service at the same level you're already under. The last thing I wanted to highlight is our security vault. This is a new physical upgrade for existing PadNet devices. Uh, it provides enhanced security, uh, 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 faster, more streamlined testing, free upgrades to ICD-10 codes, a free year of service, a free read license so uh, physicians that want to interpret their own studies uh, can do that, no problem. Uh, and it also makes your PadNet device uh, device agnostic by which I mean typically when you're performing a PadNet device, you have a PadNet laptop that goes with it, and those are sometimes a little bit sticky because they're not under warranty through Biomedics. Uh, they're under warranty through Dell. Uh, this uh, security vault divorces you from your need uh, for, that, uh, for that PadNet laptop, allowing you to use any wireless device in the office to perform a study. I perform tests on my, on my just my smartphone that I use typically on a day-to-day -day basis. I find it very slick, very e easy to use. So anybody who's interested in the security vault should definitely give us a call at 888-889-8997. Uh, at this point, I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, if anybody has any other questions that I haven't attended to, please feel free to ask me now. Okay, since there don't seem to be any questions, I'm going to let everyone go. I appreciate everyone's time today, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow during our Thursday webinar about uh, how to perform quality studies. I appreciate your time. You have a nice rest of your day.